Welcome back, everyone. We've had great piping from Stuart Little and Bruce Gandy, and now it's on to our third and final player today, Jack Lee from Surrey, British Columbia. To me, Jack is a slightly younger brother, and back in the day, we used to go back and forth a little bit in, this, in the solo results, believe it or not. But I then went on to pipe banding, and Jack went on to winning every major prize on the planet. So he's covered all bases. He's been around so long that he was honored last year at the Northern Meetings in Inverness for his 40th consecutive appearance there. Wow. He's worked so hard at piping and essentially pressed record on many of his practice sessions, which has created the aptly named website bagpipemusic.com, a great resource of tunes for all players. Jack is also appearing for Bruce Gandy's charity. So brucegandyfoundation.org is again that, that charity and Tartantown will be supporting that as well. So that's great news. Jack, to me, the story is about as much anything as he's a fierce competitor. He was pretty fierce in SFU as well, an in-your-face type of guy. And Neil, perhaps you could allude to a memory you had with Jack at SFU. I think it, I think it was my second practice up at the university. And um, I don't know what was going on, but Jack would come around the circle, um, you know, put his head down and listen to notes and then put his head up. And he put his face right here. And after the third time, I'd had enough. And so I just kissed him full on the lips. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, and everybody had a good giggle at it, but it didn't stop him. I mean, he stayed in my face <laughs> for the rest of my career at SFU. And it, wow. it, it, did, it did me good, though. <laughs> <laughs> wow, there's a fast learning curve at SFU sometimes back in those days. Yeah. Right? Let's, uh, what do you say yes. we, invite, we invite Jack in to, to either respond or say hello or something? Let's get Jack in here. There's a kiss for you, Jack. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I don't remember that, Neil. That's amazing. Wow, wow. Jack Lee, welcome. Are you, have, you can be able to block out certain memories in, the, in your life. <laughs> Jack, welcome. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure, gentlemen. And you know, you are one busy guy. And, and may I just say, you found time, even though you just became a grandfather for the third time as we broadcast this. Congratulations. Thanks. It's a very, very happy weekend around this wing of the Lee family. We're going to meet our new granddaughter later today wow With social distancing it's all a little bit different now and we're you know right. not getting too close and stuff like that there'll be no picking up and hugging your grandchildren anymore for a wee while but Fantastic. very very exciting around here i'm super happy great stuff tell us tell us about your family in general many people won't know who you're married to who your kids are what what they're doing okay i'm married to christine christine lee we've been married for 35 years and we have three sons andrew colin and john um, and, and they've all, they've all been professional pipers and, and all of that. And two of them, Andrew and John are still piping in the band. Andrew and Colin are married and they, they have children. They have, each have two dogs and children. Wow. And, uh, Colin is the one, the middle son, Colin, who just had the, our granddaughter this weekend. John is engaged. My youngest son, John is engaged to a lovely lady from just over the border in the United States. So um they were to be married this summer actually and it was wow. another covid wedding cancellation thing so that statistic i'm sure That's, yeah about that but so so far well, we're three for three two are married one getting married listen i can get my internet pre pastor's license and we could do a zoom wedding for you jack if you want <laughs> camping is that is neil let me get back <laughs> on that okay <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, Jack. And uh, another thing that keeps you extraordinarily busy is Piping Hot Summer Drummer, the hugely successful school that many have visited over the last, what, 25 years or so. Yeah. This is the first year, unfortunately, we will have to go virtual online, but that, thank goodness you've made that decision. How's that looking and how's that shaping up for 2020? Um, it's actually say? looking very well. We're, we've got a lot of people enrolled already. So typically we have around 300 students come to piping hot each year over the two weeks this year we're running it on zoom because of the coronavirus and i don't know what we what we should expect for our number of students but i think it'll be quite large because a lot of pipers and drummers and highland dancers are just a little bit you know bummed out that there's nothing to do this summer no events to go to no competitions and things so we're getting people in and rolling from all around the world actually so that's people. been quite exciting and sure. um 
new in the Highland Dancing Front, we have Mary L. Esperance joining us, and she's the world champion Highland dancer, so that's very cool. And on the piping side, Stuart Little, Callum Beaumont, yourself, Terry, many from the SFU band, Donald Lindsay from the Eastern United States, and on the drumming side, uh, the great Stephen McWhorter, the many-time world champion, he is in for snare drum, Eric McNeil, um, Christina Hanks on bass, Owen Russell on, on tenor, and all kind of coordinated by Reed Maxwell. So uh, we're very excited about it. It's an adventure. And doing it on Zoom is just a whole new thing, as you know. It's just a well, little bit different. A solid lineup, and wish you all the best with that. Thank you. And, and when, you're, when you're not busy... We have, we, have, we have, which is not that often, we have a connection with, through Tartantown as well, with, with your business, Lee and Sons Bagpipes. So the pipes and bags are, are doing very well, and, and uh, you are playing the drones yourself, correct? I am, yeah. So the, on the business side, we've been pleasantly surprised at how busy we are through the corona crisis here. Um, you sometimes fear that people won't buy baseball gloves and hockey sticks and tennis rackets and, and bagpipes and, and things that are kind of on the hobby part of their lives. But uh, pipers are pretty committed and we've been steadily going at it with making pipes, pipe bags, chanteries and things like that. And um, yeah, I've been playing our pipes for, and for a few years now. So anyway, I was, I was fortunate enough to win the Glenfiddich uh, two years ago playing our bagpipes the set I, I feel like I'm taking too much credit a set that Andrew made no, I, in the set. Jack oldest guy ever to win the Glen Fiddler. I am yeah that's, that's all right that's, ever, <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah but that's it was the best free advertising area uh, ever when I won the Glen Fiddler on these pipes so we've been kind of busy with that ever since good 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 excellent um so we're gonna look look at your first video now you did it for us. Thanks very much. And it's a... Did it turn out slow, okay? It was on my iPhone. It turned out just fine. No problem. It was a slow air and hornpipes. Um, do you remember anything about the tunes there? Uh, it was a Samantha's Lullaby. Samantha's Lullaby. Yeah, it's correct. a beautiful... I haven't played that one for a while. It's an absolutely gorgeous slow air written by Arthur Gillis. Uh, and I knew Arthur a little bit. He was a wee bit older than me. But uh, he was certainly a, a force to be recognized with when I started competing in Scotland and he wrote this gorgeous slow air Samantha's lullaby for his daughter. Right. And that follow that with a couple of classic hornpipes. Mm -hmm. So let's after the video we'll uh, come back to a Neil and Jack chat and let's take a look and listen to that video now.
we're back. It's just Jack and me. That was a, a nice set, Jack. I was very happy to see you got through the last part of Lily and Livingston. <laughs> it's a tremendous the tune we're going named at. after a tremendous person, Lillian, by a, written by a great piper, Bill Livingston. Yeah. So, uh, nice set. Um, the uh, playing in your, I presume that's your office or your yeah, workspace yeah, or something. My home office, yes. Is that where you practice? It is, yeah. So, what's your personal, right? Now that there's no band stuff going on, really, um, and we're not sure if there's any solos coming up or not. Um, what's your practice regimen at the moment? How is it different from what you did before? Well, I find myself doing more playing than I normally would in the spring. Normally springtime, I'm off on an airplane to a lot of different places doing workshops and, and piping schools and that type of thing. And they've all been scrubbed this year because of the virus. So I, I'm home. Um, the backyard's never going to look so good as it is this year. It's getting all the attention in the time, you know. Mine too, Yeah. <laughs> But I play, you know, I don't play every day, but I play almost every day. And uh, I'm recording for our website all the time. So I'm into new music and exploring a lot of, I've got a great stack of other p rocks that, you know, probably no one's really heard before that I'm working so on. So we're we're going to talk about the stuff recording. that you're playing in a minute. I want, I want to talk about the, the routine of your practice because a lot of people watching this want to get some tips on, you know, what is a, a good routine for practice for you? Is it like... You know, 20 minutes a day, do you do any practice chanter work? Uh, you, you, okay. Like we talked to Stuart earlier, and he spends a lot of time working on his sound, and then he'll pick a, a certain type brand of tunes that he's going to practice one day, and then it's different another day. What, what were you, how, what, okay. so what does your me, typical practice look like? Here's a Canadian answer. It depends. It really does depend on the time of year and what I'm doing. So if I'm in, in competition season and getting ready for competition, I'm, I'm on doing a record right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was eldest son Andrew walking in. He had a check in his hand. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> anyway, if I'm getting ready for competition, I'm doing a lot of work on sound. The sound is is the is really the the driving thing. But right now, I'm working on keeping my playing going as well as I can and recording for the website. So I'm not doing any chant work really, any meaningful chant work. Once in a while, I'll want to work on some particular thing, but. Uh, typically, uh, I put a new set of, of um, moisture control systems in my pipes at the start of the week, and I can play on that for an entire week. So I typically lick my chantry, blow my drones, lick, lick and pitch a chantry, put it together, and start to play. And I'll have a whole barrage of things that I'm working on. Again, things I'm going to record for bagpipemusic.com. And I will go for a, an hour, let's say an hour. And I'll play a bunch of stuff to get the pipes warmed up and get myself going. And then I'll hit the record button and record a bunch of tunes. And I usually finish off with a P-Brock or maybe two P-Brocks, depending on um, how large they are and, and how well. In a, nor in a normal year, do you have a solo bagpipe and a band bagpipe? I, play, I, only, I only play the one instrument, but I change the chanter. Yeah, okay. And I have... Uh, drone reads, same? No, I actually keep the drone reads the same. So in our band, it's a bit of a bit of a, a mixed bag. Some people play cane. Some people play combination of cane and synthetic. I personally play synthetic in the band and the solos, and I'm very happy with my setup. The reeds I'm playing just suit our pipes so well. I play the canning drone reeds, so they just work great in there with the Henderson harmonic bass. Very happy with that, and so they just go well for solos and for bands. So I changed the chanter and the reed for for solos and bands. So so anyway. Because I'm doing this routine of recording, I'm a, a fairly efficient practicer right now. I don't have to dawdle about and, and muck around with reads and things. I'm just, I'm set to go and I just warm the pipes up and play. So I'm doing, you know, a good hour a day, many of the days, and I just kind of take the weekend off and work around the house or visit grandchildren. You, I was just thinking of watching you talk. If we had muted you and somebody's watching this, I could be talking to a French man because you're very handsy. A lot of hand things going on when you talk. It's a thing, yeah. It's a thing. It's the way it's, I was born, a, perhaps. No, it's a TV tip. Just keep your hands out of the shot. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> talking of hands, um, I, I know you like everybody to think that you're 45, but we know that you're 62. And <laughs> your your hands are... I was always, I've always been struck by the precision in your playing ever since I met you. And... Um, have you just been blessed with very precise hands or do you work at it? And, and even at this age, you're not losing a step really. 
Thanks for the kind words. Um, it would no, be a lie to, really to say I don't work at it. It would be a lie to say I don't work at it. Of course, I work at it, but um, I don't know, man. I, I've I've never really stopped playing. To be honest with you, I'm gonna take lots of breaks for holidays and university and and you know different things like that. But I've kind of kept my playing going through the years, and I've probably two things I have not lost. One is the passion to play well. I've, I've really not lost the passion to play well and I want to play well when I play. So that's an important thing because, uh, you know, I might just enjoy playing, which I, I love to play, but I love to play well. And the other thing I haven't lost, I think, is the problem solving. So different things come up in your career and you're, you're playing changes and you've got to do this and figure this out and figure that out. And I haven't lost the passion for um, analyzing the problems and finding solutions and trying to make it better. So, um, I don't know. I just keep going as long. I feel like I'm going to play, you know, as long as it makes sense to play. And I keep thinking that my body will shut me down at some point and, you know, I won't be able to play at the level I want to, but, um, so far that hasn't happened. I'm hoping it doesn't happen anytime soon. So, um, how did you get, I want to talk about how you got to where you are in terms of, where you were influenced both in pipe bands and in solo stuff, but just give us a run through of like who taught you through your years. Like you were, I know you were born in Manitoba and ended up in BC. That's where you started piping in BC. It was yeah? in BC. Yeah. So we were born, we were born into Terry and I were born into a very large piping family with a lot of piping influences in the family through great grandfather, uncle, cousins, stuff like that. Um, so I can, I always had a practice chanter. I don't remember a time in my life. I didn't at least have a practice chanter. I'm when I was two years old, I had a practice chanter. And so we had a two or three of them kicking around the house, little toys and stuff like that. But when we got going, um, our uncle from Seattle was able to get my parents and grandparents to get us to the primary teacher in this part of the world. In those days was a man named Jimmy McMillan. And Jimmy was a pupil of the blind piper from Glasgow. So Jimmy was the, uh, the, the man who really inspired us and got us going for many, many years. It was great. And all the way through into the professional ranks. And when I started to compete in Scotland and get, became more familiar with a lot of people over there, I was very fortunate to receive instruction from some really great players. And so on the list of the really great players I had instruction from would be Jimmy McIntosh, Marie Henderson, Angus J. McClellan, and uh, Andrew Wright. So, those four had a big impact on me. Uh, stylistically, I've always considered myself to be kind of a Donald McLeod guy. Um, I listen to Donald McLeod still very regularly and admired him so much for his genius and his skill and his musicality. So um, I guess Jimmy McMillan onto these kind of people to uh, get me to where I wanted to get to, you know? The, um, you don't, take many liberties with your music. I talked to Stuart earlier about um, he will put little quirk bits in even his MSRs, you know, little variations and stuff. And you've always been pretty much as it, as it is, like play it. Okay, not exactly. I don't think that's exactly correct. Here's how I, no. what I think. I think the great classics are the great classics. And I just have a little line in the sand. I don't like to mess with the great classics. I think okay. they are stand alone and should be respected like that. That's just how I feel. But with other tunes that are not the great classics, you know, I, yeah. I very often tweak and modify as I, where I, I see okay. fit, but I just don't do it with Pbrox nor the great classic March to Space. Okay. What, which is what I was leading to is, um, you mentioned Andrew Wright, obviously a big influence in your Pbrox development. Yes. Right? Now, that you're one of the elder statesmen in the piping world and still competing, and you prepare yourself and go through the set tunes, imagining that there is a competition season coming. Do you bounce your playing off anyone? Are you left to your own devices? And you, your own style is going to creep into your, your paper playing, your own tastes and flavors of the different tunes. Uh, or are you playing it as you went through it with Andy? And, and okay, I, I haven't years. really bounced my playing off anyone for a long time. Okay. And whether that's the right strategy or not. After the last Glenfiddich, I came back actually thinking, which was a year ago, um, if I get the chance to go to the Glenfiddich again, I'm probably going to do that. Bounce, um, make some, uh, make a phone call and, and uh, see if I can't bounce my playing off somebody else. Because I think um, 
I'm a, I'm a very tough critic on myself. I record myself and I listen to it and try to improve on it and all of that. But I think uh, it's great to have fresh ears. So I'm going to, uh, I think, make a change there. Cool. So um, another topic now. Uh, you've talked about your bagpipes music.com is that correct is that the correct url it is Make oh, music. i see you drinking there so jack in, in honor of you um oh my god i'm drinking green tea what are you drinking red wine what is this this is this is a nice little thing that you called hobnob a nice pinot noir from Dave, Saint Helena, it, California. i want you to know it's two in the afternoon here if i start drinking red wine it, it can't be it can't work out well well I've Plus, i have to drive an hour to go meet my new granddaughter yeah you, you're the third guy i've been talking to i'm fed up <laughs> <laughs> anyway bagpipemusic.com have you ever seen the mu- the movie Julie and Julia? It's yes, a woman. I right, have. And, yeah, years and ago. She's obsessed with Julia Childs, and she decides to do every recipe in the Julia <laughs> Childs anthology. It seems to me that's what you're doing. You're recording every bagpipe tune ever published. Is that the road you're on? Uh, you're close. So, I don't know. It, 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 it just started innocently well, well over 30 years ago when Jimmy McMillan said to me, hey, you should start recording yourself and listening back. This is when I started competing to compete in Scotland. So when you go to compete in Scotland, it's just a whole new level of expertise required because the, there are so many great players there and it's such a high level of play. So anyway, he said you sh- should start recording yourself. And I started to do that. And I was amazed at how bad it sounded relative to how I thought it sounded when I played. So and I've always felt that way The tape recorder is so brutally honest. And then for Piping Hot Summer Drummer, I thought, well, I should record. I I put out a tune package each year, and maybe I should just record it and give students the the recordings of the tunes. And I started to do that, and it was really popular. So anyway, I just kept going. So now I know that there are about 15,000 tunes in the bagpipe world. There are 15,000 tunes. So uh, for me, again, this has taken many years, but I have bagpipe music written if that's even a, a word bagpipe music written in the bagpipe music writer software most of them and i have recorded i'm well i haven't recorded all of them that's for sure but i've recorded uh, the majority of them so i'm just chipping away at that this this is kind of a corona year for me i'll probably make a significant dent in the unrecorded tune so i just get a kick out of it i mean i like through this whole process, I've learned so much about some of these great composers through time. And I just appreciate their music. And I've learned so much about people I'd never heard of and who, who published books and written tunes from all over the world. It's just been an absolute pleasure to play music like this. So I do, guess do I'm going it? through this path of, lear- of do you planning do it right? the majority of them. Sorry, Jack. Do you do it writer by writer? Do you do, I'm going to do the, the Peter McLeod Jr. tunes all in a lump or do you just jump? Well, I kind of go by book. Okay. <laughs> if I come up with a new book, I go, Whoa, sure. poof, you know, fresh, fresh material. And I will, uh, oftentimes I have these tunes already, but if I don't, I bag back music, write them. And then I record them. And I listen back and, and see what I think of them and see if I need, think I should change them a little bit. No, then before they make it onto the website, I've worked really, really hard to ask for permission from the composers and I've gotten it in virtually all cases. And however, many of the composers, I just said, sorry, I've just never heard of them. I don't know anything about them. And another big um, percentage of the composers are gone now. So there's really, it's really hard to find, find them and their families and ask for permission. So anyway, I've spent a lot of time working on that part of it too and making sure that I treat people with respect. So um, in Terry's introduction, he said, Jack Lee is a fierce competitor. Now, I, I think that's kind of pots and black kettles because I've never met anyone as competitive as Terry Lee. I always said that if he wasn't in <laughs> yeah, bike piping, great. yeah, if he wasn't in piping, he'd probably be like a professional baseball coach or something. Um, like, do you... Like you said you play because you want to play well. Um, have you always played to win? No, that's, I've never really been a play to win person. I've been a play okay. to play at my absolute best person since yeah. I was a kid. And so some of, my, some of my happiest moments, for example, in Inverness, involved getting no prize because I felt I played really well and other people played better and they won, and I'm super happy with that. And right. some of my down moments were 
getting into a prize list and being so disappointed with how I played. I just can't believe, you know, I'm so down about how I played. So for me, the competitive drive is not the winning. It's the pushing myself to the limit and playing it absolutely as well as I can possibly play. And if I do that, I'm the happiest guy out there. So I, I was leading you into that because I knew the answer because from my time at SFU, um, one of the biggest lessons I, I learned, and I'm sure all sorts of pipers that have been through the band, was that we never once said, let's win this. Right? It was always playing to the standard. And if, it, if you aren't playing to the standard of excellence that was acceptable within the band, then that was what wasn't good enough. That's right. And, and so then take your very most excellent standard into the competition and then it's anybody's guess what's going to happen. And I just want to make that dif distinction because a lot of people think that in the grade one pipe band world, it's like dog eat dog and that we don't like each other and all that stuff. And some of my greatest friends are from competing pipe bands and there's a great camaraderie in there there wasn't Very much in so, days yeah. when I was growing up, but there, I think there is now. Would you agree with that? I, I definitely agree with that, particularly in solo piping. Uh, in solo piping, there's a great camaraderie amongst the top group of pipers that that your viewers will have heard of. Um, we talk regularly, we share ideas, and we teach at piping schools together and stuff. It's fun. And if if it's your day, you, if, you know, in, at the top of the table or something, you know, you're going to be high fived and sh hand shook by a lot of people and vice versa if someone else it's their day we're all over there shaking their hand so i i like that i was getting back to your point about terry lee yes terry and i are very similar in that regard um his attitude on competition or competing is just just like mine we're not really there to win we're there to play as well as we possibly can it was a life principle instilled in us by our parents and grandparents whatever you do 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 it to your best. That was the principle that we heard many, many times growing up. So I think it did stick. So um, let's talk, this is the last little section. I want to talk about your pipe band life because 81 is when SFU started. But before that, I think I remember you with a band called CP Richmond. CP Air, that that's Canadian Pacific Airlines. Yeah, CP Air, that's right. Yeah. And what, would, what did you do before that? What was your apprenticeship in pipe bands? Well, we, well, I grew up in, you know, the Vancouver area and played in a number of sort of junior bands, the Aberystwyth Pipe Band, Aberystwyth Legion Pipe Band and the Seaforth Cadets. And I had a, a season, two seasons, sorry, with the City of Victoria. Um, so it was, City of Victoria was great because Jamie Troy is so knowledgeable about tone and, you know, setting up pipes and stuff. It was just a great experience for me learning basically. So I would, would be 16 years old at that point. I became the pipe manager of this band called the CPR Pipe Band when I was there for a couple of years, when I was 17. And when I was 18, we went to Scotland um, in grade two. And uh, it was a great trip. And we won, won the grade two at Cowell and at, and at the European Championships as well. So um, that band kind of morphed its way into the SFU band in the first early years. Now, none of those players are still playing in the band with the exception of Rob McNeil and myself, but, but it was a great time. And uh, fortunately for me, I, I was only 18, but all the players in the band were really, really good. Uh, they were top solo players in the amateur grades in the Vancouver area in those days. And same with the drumming. So we just had a very good group of teenagers. Yeah. That, and uh, it was a fun, great experience for me to learn how so to set up a band. I, you're the perennial pipe sergeant. <laughs> at SFU and I, I talked to um, Stuart and Bruce about the management of the music and the development of sound in a grade one band and both those guys um, use the, the team approach and the, of course the, the inaugural team is you and Terry but over the years you, you brought the voices and the ears of people in like Alan Bevan or Ian Whitelaw or, um, and the use of Reed Maxwell when he came along uh, to work on ensemble stuff. Can you speak to like how that has helped SFU develop to become one of the like six time world champion? Like, how Well, I think, um, yeah, you're quite right. It started off with Terry and I generally and then expanded greatly. So having Reed Maxwell in was, you know, a magnificent step forward for the band because he brought the drum corps up to such a level. And then we, it was just incredible. Um, and brought so many great ideas for the ensemble of the band and, and tune, tune ideas and all, all that type of thing. We realized through that experience that 
a lot of other people have great ideas too and a lot of expertise and you mentioned some of them um so over the time that i've been in the band which is pretty much day one uh we've tried to create an environment where people are encouraged to bring ideas to the table tune suggestions or whatever but the pipe major will decide and the culture of our band is that's okay thanks for the idea we appreciate it but the pipe major will decide and there's no getting no getting yourself in all, all upset about it and grumpy leave your ego at the door the pipe manager will decide so that's always been a modified um, modified dictatorship i believe in that format i've never been the pipe major i don't insist on my ideas reaching the front at all i bring ideas from time to time but in this um, generation of the band alan will decide and the culture of our band is that we just support the pipe major's decision and move on. And on the other part of our culture is never go back to revisit a, a decision. The, um, in the earlier days, just when you and Terry were like boss one and boss two, like you were the bottom, you were, you were hands and technique. Terry was music and drones. Was that a, a, a decision you made or did you just it kind was, of fall yeah, into I, those roles? I, it was an obvious, it was a decision we made, but it was the right decision too. I think uh, Terry brought the overall package and um we needed that and he was really great at that and i brought the the details i could coach and develop the pipers and so because i was a professional piper myself and so i think that we we just morphed into the right roles there i think if our roles had been different if i was a pipe major and terry was a pipe sergeant we wouldn't be sitting here with six world championships i think we did the right people in the right jobs you never wanted to be the pipe major i never did no yep. I know I didn't. I, if I wasn't a committed soloist, you know, maybe I might have been interested. But I was, I just so passionate about Peabrock and and solo piping and competing in Scotland and going to Inverness and these sort of things. I'm very. I've been very very happy in my role as the pipe sergeant of SFU, and I see myself supporting Alan Bevan as long as I'm able to and as long as he wants me to. All right. So I've lost. I had a little sheet of paper with all sorts of quick fire. We end up these interviews with little quick fire questions, and I don't have my sheet of paper, so I'm just going to ask you. Pause something. button and come back, or what? No, I'm going to ask you top off the top of my head. Oh my! Right. Cool. This okay. could be dangerous. Recommend a red wine. <laughs> come on, it's a coronavirus evening. What what glass of red wine are you going to drink? I'll have a red wine tonight, but not right now. But what? I'm driving what to you, my granddaughter. What would it be? A Shiraz, a Pinot? It's a Shiraz, it's a Shiraz and, and Cab Sav if I have a red wine, yeah. Okay. Pinot if I have a little, if I have the interest in it, but Shiraz usually. What, what's your favorite pub in Glasgow during the World's Week? You know what, I don't really go much to the park bar and that kind of thing, but I've been to the park bar a couple of times. But Okay, what's your favorite beer tent? <laughs> I have no favorite beer tent in Scotland oh, because no, anyway, anytime anyway. I've gone to a beer tent in Scotland, it's been a, just a mob of people. And what, sort of what's the point of that? I'll say hi to a few people and leave. That's sort of the extent of it. Uh, I me think Enum beer. Claw, Montreal. Uh, Enum Claw, Santa for sure. Rosa. Enum Claw, without a doubt, because the season is yeah. over. We've had a, a good run of it. It's yeah. nice to unwind with your friends. And that, Enum Claw is the place for me. Your favorite James Bond? You only live twice. Okay, so that's Roger Moore. Roger Moore. No, it was it was Sean Connery way back. Oh, okay. He dies early in the movie, and then he makes a comeback. And the line is, "You only live twice. Don't do it okay. again. You only live twice." Beatles or Rolling Stones? A oh, Beatles for sure. J Lo or Shakira? <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about the Super Bowl halftime show? Shakira. There you go. Okay. <laughs> What's your favorite Disney character? Pluto. Perfect size for a pipe core. 18. Bigger panel at the Worlds or just keep Absolutely. it as it is? Absolutely. The big, the panel, oh my goodness. The panel at the Worlds needs to grow, no question about it. In every grade? Throw it the high, throw it low, all that, you know? Yep. All right, so Terry's back. We're done, Jack. I appreciate it. You, nice you talking to you. You can now go and visit your granddaughter and yep. wet the head with a glass of red wine. Later. Great stuff, boys. Thank you. Neil, thanks for your help today. Really appreciate it. No, no that. problem. Yeah. And guys, we're going to finish off with Jack's second recording. 
It's a 6-8 merch and jigs set. Jack, any comments on the tunes you played there or anything about it? Uh, the 6-8 I played was Meg McRae. I think that's a tremendous tune written by Duncan Johnston, the late Duncan Johnston. So I just had it's a great good thing. I hadn't done it in a wee while. And a couple of classic jigs, right? Yeah, Hands March, all that. Good stuff. Brazen Melnish, maybe? Yeah? Yep. Hands March and Brazen Melnish. I there you go. Those tunes. All right. Great stuff. Enjoy. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have fun visiting the grandkids. Here we go. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Have a good day. Thank you. And we hope everyone out there enjoyed this presentation. Watch for more in the near future and uh, check out Tartantown for updates. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Cheers.